Um, if my shop were to double in size, C2 Lawson is curious, what kind of things or machinery would I add? Well, my shop is about to double in size. And so here are the things that I am going to bring into the expanded shop. Um, my vacuum former, my big vacuum former. I have a two by three foot vacuum former that went and lived with Frankie Bolito for a few years. Now it is back in San Francisco. It deserves to come back in here. Um, I have a belt sander from, from Mythbusters, from M7. You would have seen it there at M7. It's a four foot long belt sander with like a six inch wide belt. Um, it needs a little repair, but it's a stunner of a sander and it comes back here. My other lathe. I love having a small benchtop mill and a full size mill. What a luxury that is. Um, I'm also, I, I love having more than one lathe. I love the idea that I could do multiple setups for uh, workflow stuff. Um, and amazingly, my lathe is uh, built by a Taiwanese company in the 70s, I believe, under a whole bunch of different names, only one of them being Shen Wai, S-H-E-N-W-A-I. I have two different Shen Wai lathes. I have a 1540 and I have like a 1036 off the top of my head, give or take. Um, so second lathe comes in here. That, that will feel like a spectacular luxury. Um, and then the other thing that's coming in are sorting racks, racks for delineating tools and materials. Um, they are a particular set of sorting racks and we're gonna shoot some videos on them because it's a hell of a story. Uh, and it's an ongoing story. And I am, I am putting these racks in my shop, but I am, I'm considering myself a steward of them. Yeah, I'm, all the details will remain until later. It's very, very exciting. Um, oh, okay, here we go. Uh, have you ever designed a sh part of your shop out of spite? This is great. James the Cyclist is asking this. Have you ever designed a part of your shop out of spite? I have a few elements of my space that is the way that it is because someone else wouldn't do it like that. <laughs> um, you know, I'm a big believer in that there's always more room for storage on the Z-axis if you're paying attention. So I like going up. But I have 14-foot ceilings in this shop, and up has meant quite high up in some regards. And there are some things way up back there that, that really that, that back wall is too high to be regularly useful to me. Like every time I need to go get something from deep in it, I kind of have to work up my, oh, I gotta go get a ladder and not just any ladder. I have to get one of the bigger ladders and I have to figure out the tile puzzle of fitting it in here. I think the, 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 the you're right though. James the Cyclist, that this is sometimes how shops, like, you're like, I'm just going to fix this problem in this way. Actually, I'll tell you one, um, was I, I bought that, uh, I bought this lovely Craftsman Woodworkers lathe that's back there. And when I first bought it, I built a stand for it. And so now it had a stand and they needed to park it somewhere. And there was just this pocket of space behind the table saw that made sense. And I parked it there temporarily and there it still lives because... I don't think there's a better space for it in the cave. Um, that is kind of an answer to your question. Uh, and I think we have one time for one more. Um, and it comes from uh, our friends at Luna Replicas. Hello, guys. Um, Luna Replicas a few years ago made an absolutely magnificent set of the uh, NASA coveralls, the blue NASA coveralls. You often see all those right stuff guys running around in. Um, and Luna Replicas, I just wanted to tell you, I ran my coveralls through five more wash cycles this week just because it was downstairs. And I was like, oh yeah, let's soften this up even more. Uh, when you want to weather something, one of your best ways to do it is just to wash and dry it, wash and dry it, wash and dry it. It softens the fabric, it cinches it up, it makes it a little bit tighter. It just ends up making it look a little older. But Lunar Replicas had a question, and it is, have you ever bought something for the shop or for your collection and found that wanting it was much better than having it? Oh, so many things. So, so many things. Um... So let's see here, right? I'm looking at the tools that are on the top shelf because there are tools that get almost no use whatsoever. Um, the mini table saw. Uh, I can't remember who makes it. Is it Dremel? S someone made a beautiful little machine top surface mini table saw and I bought one 
25 years ago because a friend of mine was selling it. I think it was, I think Mitch Romanowski sold me that, that little table saw. And while I love it and I love its idea and when I've used it in a shop and slice little things, I totally have been delighted by it. But it is the kind of tool that I really would only use maybe once or twice a year that once you have a cross cut sled on a big table saw, you don't really need that. I, again, now that I'm saying this, I'm thinking there are some things that I could have used that for, but it's up on a shelf that's too high for me to go get it with any regular use. And it doesn't live anywhere convenient. Wanting that table saw was definitely a better feeling than having it. And then as I'm looking what else is stacked there, there's a hand planer. Hand planers blow my mind, right? Because it's like a belt sander, except the underside, instead of being a belt, is actually three blades. Like, of tools, I'm terrified of the table saw. I'm petrified of the router. And the hand planer is effectively a saw movie as a tool. Um, I bought this Ryobi hand planer. And a friend of mine who's a lifelong contractor was like, yeah, your best thing you could do with that is just throw it out. He does not think highly of the Ryobi tools. Um, and I was like, I'm only going to use it like twice in my life. That was 13 years ago. And I have yet to pull it out of its box. <laughs> Um, this happens. This happens. We get bees in our bonnet. I get a bee in my bonnet about a certain tool or process. I buy a bunch of stuff to support that tool or process. And sometimes it never ends up integrating into the shop. Um, I have a, 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 what do you call it? A toe nailing blind hole driller. I'm sorry, my technical terminology might go over your heads here. Um, that seemed like a great idea and still like I've used it twice. My biscuit joiner. I love the idea of a biscuit joiner. I only ever get to it like once every couple of years. Cast cutting saw. I think a fan sent me that one. Um, embalming tools. Those were never, that was another fan sent me the embalming tools. I love having stuff up on the shelves that when people look around them be like embalming tools, right? Like. It's a great story. I just had a tool renaissance. Just this week, I had a tool renaissance. I was, I'm gonna show you an upcoming build, but I'm not gonna tell you what it is. Ha! So, <clears throat> I cut lots of things on this channel, and um, among the things I cut is brass. I cut brass all the time. I cut it using portable band saws. I cut it using uh, drill presses and mills. I cut it using band saws. I cut it using uh, my scroll saw. But my scroll saw has been bugging me lately and I haven't felt like I can get the sensitivity out of it that I wanted. And I recently built this box and the build will go up on tested. It's a really fun one. But in it here in the big, in the front piece, you can see the little key surround where the tiny key goes in that is made of brass. And I handmade that because when I researched these cases of this type, that was a feature of the more refined ones. And when you look at 19th, 18th century hardware, it all looks like this. It all is clearly hand built by people. Um, so I needed that key surround to be, you know, it had to be, hold on, I'm gonna draw it here. It had to be this shape. It had to be this shape, right? Where the, the outline here, the, the, the fill in the middle is what I'm left with, with brass. So I started out by drilling a hole and then I was going to chuck it into my scroll saw and cut that notch. And I started and it was such a nightmare. It was so awful. I was like, I hate the scroll saw. I finally had to admit this, I hate it. And then I thought, oh, right. And then a couple of weeks ago, I was, um, I was uh, 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 texting back and forth with the inimitable Tony Swatton, uh, uh, incredible metal maker of all sorts of things like the Infinity Gauntlet and all the swords from all of the movies. And Tony and I were texting and I was like, do you have a scroll saw you love? And he said, I just, for all that fine detail work, work like, like this kind of thing. He uses a handsaw, a coping saw, a jeweler's saw. And I happen to have some spectacular jeweler saws. 
uh, that I've had for years made by New Concepts, K-N-E-W. Uh, we're gonna shoot a video with them soon because they're old friends of Tested. Brian Meek was here 10 years ago or more showing me these beautiful saws. And I know this sounds weird, but I have never used one to cut brass plate until seriously about 30 minutes ago. Uh, no, no, sorry until I made that key surround. And then I just cut this uh, with this new blade that I have a lot of, and it worked magnificently. I know that's not super neat, but it was a proof of concept. I've always thought that cutting stuff out with a jeweler saw was gonna take way too long and be so tedious that I never got around to trying it, which is ludicrous. Because the moment I did, and by the way, this is new concepts, pressed titanium saw with a, 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 a triangulated riveted backbone. This thing is as just, just so spectacularly rigid, it's magnificent. Um, and yeah, it cut that out. So I have actually, after this, after this live stream, I'm gonna pull out the pieces of my uh, Royal Scepter from the Crown Jewels. I'm gonna start recutting out these pieces up front because I didn't know, I didn't know what you could do. That's the thing. And all of a sudden I'm like, now I wanna do all the things I didn't do. I've gotta do such... I never let myself think that it would be convenient to use this. Even though I watch all these YouTube channels of people using it, and when I finally did, it works great. It works great. Um, I would love to know in the comments what your favorite durable, super thin blade is for these for handwork. That's the information I would like because this is rocking my world, but the standard scroll saw blades are not good for handwork. What I've got in here is one of the twisties that cuts omnidirectionally, and those are also great. I have some unidirectional ones, but they're so light, they only last like one per cut, uh, and then they, they break. Uh, I know I could perhaps be a little more gentle with it and I am learning, I'm a learning computer. Um, this comes up because uh, Lang Rig, Ian Rigby, Ian Rigby, why do I think it's Ian? Ian, Ian says, you love esoteric and super specific tools and machines. What is one tool or machine that you've used in your career that most made you go, it does one job and it does it really well. So yeah. This, I, that's why I started talking about this because literally this morning I was like, I have a whole new awakening and appreciation for this tool. Um, and I wanna say one thing about new concepts because uh, it will be awkward to say it in the video with them when they come here, is that like when I look at this tool and I see the three different colors, the gray of this anodized titanium along with the burgundy red of this of this, I think this is steel, it might be aluminum, and then the anodized orange of these aluminum knobs. These three colors, they tell me so much about the mind of the designer that I'm in good hands. Sometimes I can just look at a color and know that I'm in the hands of an excellent engineer. Uh, because someone who pays attention to one detail is going to pay attention to another detail. And when someone has taken the time, I'll tell you anodizing colors is really, really difficult from a manufacturing standpoint because it's very hard to hit specific colors. It is easy to hit general colors, but specific ones can be an absolute nightmare. And so when someone goes through the trouble to build a process where the colors are consistent and they relate to each other, I notice. Thank you so much for watching. If you'd like to support us even further, you can by becoming a tested member. Uh, details are of course below, but it includes all sorts of perks and we're building them all the time. You get advanced word and behind the scenes photos of some of our projects. Questions, you get to ask direct questions during my live streams and we have some members only videos, including the Adam real time series of unbroken, unedited shots of me working here in the shop. They are weirdly meditative. Thank you guys so much. I'll see you on the next one.